just feel good, get a buzz by like seeing people writing and shouting, being with your mates and doing what everybody else is doing. You just join in with a crowd even if you don't want to. It's just normal. The only demand that exists at the moment is that walls be raised higher, that fences be put on top of walls, and then some people are demanding more walls. People do feel trapped, they feel under threat from the other side, whichever the other side is. Their whole quality of life is seriously compromised by, by what's going on in North Belfast. North Belfast is a place apart. Many people here live in a state of mind that the other side is faring better than them. And even worse, in constant fear that the other side is intent on taking over the whole district. This is paranoia on a grand scale. Even to the extent that on this stretch of road, where once there was a bus stop for all to use, there's now a bus stop for Catholics and a bus stop for Protestants. Such segregation may be confined to the history bins of South Africa and the Deep South in the United States, but it's very much alive and well, if not quite coexisting here in North Belfast. I don't agree with it, call it a rat. No, we're not a rat at all. We're defending our homes, defending pensioners' homes, helpless people from these thugs that's come in the RRA. We, we, we can't do anything else, nothing. We're not going into the areas. We're not crossing over in the Ardoin. We're not going past the roundabout. These people are intent and in coming in and trying to move us out of our houses so they can get it for their own, uh, their own people. To move, to move us out and eventually kick us out. And that's the whole problem. The Catholics are slowly pushing people out of North Belfast. Images of hatred forever seared on the consciousness of television viewers worldwide. The perception created is one of deep and bitter community division in an area of Belfast that became the sectarian murder capital during 30 years of conflict. Scratch beneath the surface and you find the perception is reality. That there is hatred, fear and loathing on the streets of North Belfast. I don't believe that North Belfast people are inherently more sectarian than people in any other part of Nor Northern Ireland. The trouble with North Belfast is that you have got alienated communities that are living jammed up against one another, sometimes with only an, an entry separating these two communities. And the two communities then grind against one another on the interfaces. Um, and there's a lot of misunderstanding and fear and anger uh, where that's going on. We want to hear from you not just the issues that are important to you, but we'd like also to hear ways that you could see that there may be solutions to the problems. The Reverend John Dunlop and Monsignor Tom Toner head a community action project that's part of a Northern Ireland Assembly initiative to investigate from grassroots level upwards reasons for the recent destructive tensions in North Belfast. So there's a separate consultation process going on with young people. And but even as they listen to the testimony of people who live with the violence of interface existence, a stabbing in broad daylight last week underlined the urgency of finding a solution to the deep-rooted mistrust. Anthony had left the house to go with a friend to buy wallpaper at Noblitz and had came back around in the arcade to go to the Big W for shopping for cleaning products. Um, on his way back around to turn the corner to go to our gate, he was approached by four to five years and was stopped in the back. Now you've said there, our gate. What do you mean by our gate? Well, there's t several entrances into your gate. They watched to see if he was heading towards the new lodge area and that was the only reason we could see why he was attacked. There was no confrontation before it. It was just as quick as it happened, they just jumped on him and he was stabbed. There is a lot of paranoia. I mean, there, there would be some people in Ardoin who haven't been out of Ardoin for years and years because they're, they're afraid of, of going into the centre of town. It's also possible that you can be attacked coming back into an area because once you go round a wall, one of the many peace lines, you're immediately identified as a member of a particular community. And as you walk round that peace line, you're liable to be attacked. And order was gradually restored but only after unfortunate casualties had occurred, two being killed and many others seriously wounded. From the very inception of the Northern Ireland state, North Belfast has endured the kind of sectarian rioting and murder that drove people from their homes across the border to what was referred to then as the Free State. 
Playwright Martin Lynch was born and raised in North Queen Street in more moderate times, although acutely aware of the troubled past. I grew up with stories from my, my, my people, my father, my, my, grand, my grandmother, about the troubles going back in 1935 and then the 1920s. In fact, my grandfather on, on my mother's side, Harvey, Charlie Harvey, was shot dead by a, a loyalist gunman in 1922, I think. I've got the cuttings in the house, went, went and found them in the library. Um, shot dead by a sniper, like, just walking along the street. Well, the biggest surprise to me was because of growing up in the Catholic side of the fence, as it were, I assumed that it was all Catholic fatalities or injuries. And when I read the papers, I was, uh, I was astonished to find that it was almost 50-50. So there was a lot of Catholic gunmen on the go um, at that time. What gives North Belfast its sectarian edge are the little pockets of nationalist and unionist communities that evolved during demographic changes in the past 30 years. Families living on the boundaries of their own communities find themselves in the melting pot of violent sectarian expression. Walls and barriers may have been taken down elsewhere, but here they want more and they want them higher and higher. After most of the trouble, they extend the defence, the height. So you feel a little bit safer, you know, the, the missiles coming over the wall. To me, it's, it's just sectarianism. It's just hatred, and it's getting worse. Is there hatred on both sides? I think there is, yeah. I think there is. So there's no trust between the... There's no trust between the communities whatsoever. Describe just how bad it can be when the rioting is going on and you're in your home here. Well... During the summer, while I was here, I actually thought the roof and the walls were going to come in around me. There was that much bricks and bottles and everything being thrown. On the other side of this interface is Newington Street. And here they tell a story with a remarkably similar tone. Most of the time it's, it's very pleasant. It's a lovely area with brilliant neighbours. Um, but nearly on a weekly basis, um, you kind of fear for your life, basically. With um, there's riots every maybe Saturday Sunday morning. Um, there's attacks on the back of the house, um, bottles, bricks. Um, because the house has been pipe bombed in the past, even if it is a pipe or, or, or sorry, if, even if it is a brick or a bottle, you're still thinking. I mean, could this be another blast bomb? You know, so it's scary at times. Back in Holidays Road, another resident, too frightened to be identified said she had been attacked by nationalist youths and called an orange bee. She said she had been struck in the head with a brick in her own backyard. 24 hours later, her home was raked with gunfire. My two and a half year old granddaughter was sleeping with me and I was putting her to bed about half eight, quarter to nine, when this shooting started. And the, the child was terrified, so was I. Later on, a policeman told me that he found 25 spent bullets from an AK-47 rifle. On the other side of that is, is Halliday Road. Mm -hmm. Halliday Road. Um, there are people there that we've, we've spoken to who say that it, it would be impossible for any of them to throw a pipe bomb up over that 16-foot high fence. Well, who's there throwing them? How did my sister get hit with one in the chest outside the front of my house? Who's throwing them? If they're not, it's not the bogeyman. Who's throwing them? For some, interface life becomes totally unbearable. Escape is the only solution. Truth is here, it's evident that the sense of fear is genuine and that families on both sides feel extremely vulnerable to attack. Tigers Bay area of North Belfast. This house is on the interface with the Catholic community. The Protestants who live in this street say they have to take precautions to protect their homes. Grills on their windows, bars on their doors. And it's even worse for this grandmother, a 52 year old grandmother, who lives in this home. She feels that she's a prisoner in her house. And when you see the gate that she has to put across her front door every evening, you can perhaps understand why she feels that she's become a prisoner. Homes under siege put their occupants under pressure, according to Tigers Bay community worker Davy Mahood and clergyman the Reverend Robert Beckett. 
you well, David, it's, it's hard to see this area, you know, improving. It's good to have a lull for a day or two, but things are getting bad again. Yeah. Well, Mr. Maggot, it's, uh, the lack of youth provisions in the area is sort of not helping much. I mean, the people that are stuck in their houses, the depression, the next Agnes, and most people in this row have had uh, problems with the stuff coming over the back. Yes, this particular street has been very, very badly hit. You know, and certainly as I visit people, I find a lot of them, their nerves are just at breaking point and tremendously high percentages of them on tranquilizers and things like that. And a number of young fellows who have committed suicide in recent months, that's the sheer the, pressure. The sad, <coughs> the sad but it's like in this street in this area that uh, the, the suicides that have happened. Thomas took his own life. He um, was depressed for a while because of a few things that he had seen over the years from, from he was young. He had seen one friend being beat to death at a bonfire. He had seen uh, his cousin just recently there. He was uh, blew up with one of those bomb things, whatever they are, and another friend has took his life, so he had an awful lot on his mind, and he took his own life in January. Do you blame the troubles mm -hmm. that he's grown up in for what happened to him? Yeah. I mean, th this area, there's nothing at all for any young man. Um, he had no work, he couldn't get work. He went there every day looking for work. Couldn't get it. And still you want to live here? Yeah. In terms of the recent, um, what gets called the Shankill feud and the, the difficulties up in uh, Glen Bryn and Ardoyne, um, we would see, we would see, an, a, a lot of people have been traumatised by that, seriously affected by that. And of course, then not not only is the person themselves affected, but their whole family and indeed their whole community are affected by these these events. Mental health social worker Graham Johnson tours interface areas dealing with trauma and stress disorders linked directly to the sectarian strife and the feelings of interface imprisonment. A lot of people are literally confined to their homes, afraid to go out because they have been threatened or, or, or feel that there is some sense of threat from uh, the other community or from various other uh, groups and individuals. And it does have a, a massive effect on their quality of life, which in turn I would argue would lead to the development of, of, of symptoms of mental health problems, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, agoraphobia. These are, these are the things we see um, daily. North Belfast has around 250 single identity community groups. When Insight spoke to families in two centres either side of the peace line, we discovered that they do share equality in one respect, suffering. How many of you uh, are having to take tranquilizers or pills or to get a, a, peace, you know, a peaceful night's sleep? Me. Well, I am. They all really have. They're all. All of you here would be on some form of tranquilizer. Yeah. Twin joyriders at night and the helicopters up and down all night long. They think this is fun to have for that. It's not when you can't sleep at night. It's not when you're stuck at the front all day and you're on nerve tablets and you're on antidepressant tablets. I mean, my children know I just say an antidepressant tablet to get a, a nerve tablet. Oh, my, 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 so, I'm sore, I'm not well, get me painkillers. What age, what's that kind of life for a child? I, mean, I, I don't think that anyone here would try to make it out that Protestant kids are angels by any means. Um, but from this area's point of view, a lot of the rioting, which, may I say, went unreported within the media, um, because as someone has said earlier, I mean, there was eight or nine kids from the city community um, ended up in hospital with um, injuries by slates or whatever like that there, needed stitches um, last year. Um, by no means are the angels, but a lot of it is certainly orchestrated. Of course you're going to kids, if they think they're going to have a bit of fun, of course they're going to gather there, but see trying to tell them the danger that's there. And it's happened to me, people stage. have been hurt, they just don't realise, you know what I mean, that's, that's what the frightening bit. And then also trying to tell them that even if there is trouble and they go away, and they're not protecting us, they're not doing us any favours. To me the rats are what they can't in there, so that's just the day we're in. That's just normal, everyday like life. There's nothing else to do. 
But our, our main problem is at night, once it gets dark and we're in bed, our homes have been attacked at half four in the morning. And if you're out there, woken up out of your sleep, and you see these people coming at you and looking at you with such hatred, and they don't know you, this is what is so frightening. And these people didn't car. This was half four in the morning. Um, that iron bars, ball barns, bottles, baseball bats. And it was just madness. We feel like intimidated in this part. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. There's no breathing space or nothing for us. You know, and the same with the kids and all. It's just we're just like, stuck in this rut and we can't get out of it. It's not living. It's caged up. An animal wouldn't get caged up the way we're caged up. My cats is more freedom than what I have. That's the truth. Each side sees the other as having the advantage when it comes to amenities, shops, street cleaning, post boxes and funding. Each side blames the other for starting trouble. The Community Action Project has heard Protestants express fears that a growing Catholic population is trying to make North Belfast a green area. Real or perceived, such beliefs create dangers. We have never heard a trace of that in any of the Catholic areas of wanting to impinge on the territory. But perception is perception, and though it may be false, the fact that it's there is true, and the fact that it influences people, and that particularly that it influences the dependence on paramilitary for protection, and influences young people in, in seeing themselves as guardians of their, their homes and territories and so, on, and so on, is again one of these running sores that is, is, has to be tackled. But there are instances, and it's been admitted to by people that we were talking to the other day in, in Tigers Bay, that sometimes there's young lads from the present side to start the riots. Well, I would say it'd be very few occasions that it happens. And if it is, it's, it's through true frustration at uh, the situation ongoing for so long. You know what I mean? And the pain they see in their families, and the pain they see all around them. You know I mean? People don't want to live in that situation. And it is going to cause... Uh, hot headedness, tempers will flare, uh, things will happen. It's to be expected. And let's face it, the police aren't doing anything apart from uh, sticking up for the Catholics. Do you mistrust the Catholics? Yes, in every way. Do you hate the Catholics? I wouldn't honestly turn around and say I hate them, no. But I'm sure as hell not going to stand and watch them wreck and burn the houses. The difficulty is that people on one side don't understand or appreciate sometimes the, per the perceptions and the realities of what it's like on the other side, even though they're living in extremely close proximity to one another. I think in North Belfast that we have got to solve this thing together in North Belfast. Otherwise, I suspect we are not going to be able to solve it at all. We can't solve it separately. Somehow or other, we've got to try to solve it together. The Community Action Project has also uncovered serious concerns about the development of young minds in the North Belfast area. Educational needs are not being met, and the lack of job prospects has led to feelings of low self-esteem among the young. According to Martin Lynch, the Protestant community has been left behind because nothing has been done to redress the loss of traditional jobs in heavy industry. I think Catholics are in a marginally better position in that they have a 20, 30 year history of diversifying into other educational areas um, and a more openness to, to change because, because they've had to. The Protestant community seems to be still stuck in the old industrial base mentality and, and the schools and the system that's serving them at the moment hasn't moved as quickly as, it, as I think it needs to. I think there's a massive shift that's gone on in the, in the Protestant community because those opportunities which were accessible into heavy engineering and so on are just not there anymore uh, and therefore they have to make this shift into where are the employment opportunities now um, and I think there are young people who are very intelligent it's not lack of intelligence you know these are intelligent young people the trouble is they're coming out of schools with no qualifications you know and the question is whether they can top their intelligence and get them into a system which is going to lead them to employment. Look, I want to tell you something even more depressing the youth of tomorrow are already lost. The people who are 15, 16, 17 in those areas don't have a future. They have no education. They have therefore no prospect of getting jobs in the 21st century because you need qualifications for jobs in the 21st century. It's time to look at the four and five year olds because the really depressing thing is the 15 to 17 year olds are lost. I think it's a very pessimistic outlook to have. 
it's like those young people not having hope or saying it of no hope. I mean, Brian Feeney's just discarded them, throwing them away in a, in a junk heap. And if those young people think that they are on a junk heap coming from sort of responsible people that I would call Brian Feeney, one of those pe people, I mean, if, if, if they're labelled like that, then they're going to react like that. Jimmy Quinn runs a project called Realising Potential for a number of schools in North Belfast. If those young people don't see a possible way in life, then there is no hope for, for them. What we do is to let them see that there, every, anything's possible in life within reason. That's why we would, one of the things we do with them is try to provide them with a realistic career path, something that is achievable, something that's time-bound, and something that they can measure their own progress by. Giving young people back their self-esteem may be an achievable goal, but when it comes to improving cross-community interaction, peer pressure rules create a climate of fear. Because if you had Catholic friends or, or friends who just turn against you and just are oh, your feeling lover and all that there, so... Is that not sad? Uh, I have um, lots of like, friends who are Protestants uh, being involved in football and all you, like, yeah, you, you meet Protestant players and they're like, I have no problem with them, you know. And um, in school we have lots of trips all the way with Protestants who don't try and get us working together, cross community trips. And like, you ask gamers what they think and they're the same, they're the same as us, like they, we're not nervous meeting each other or anything, but we just get on like normal people. You would be scared because it's just like one of us walking into the day lodge and talking to them. And if anybody found out that we were talking to them, we'd end up getting paid out or something. Or getting beat, uh, or something like that. <coughs> it's just the same if Catholics were to come in their Protestant area. And talk to us, so it would just, be, so just be the same. I don't really have an understanding because I've never even been in a Protestant community. So I haven't... I'd be afraid to go in just in case anybody recognised me or something. In case be attacked. But I suppose it'd be the way around for Protestants coming into a Catholic community. They wouldn't come in because they'd be afraid. The views of young people and their future prospects will be a key element in the Community Action Project report when it's handed over to First Minister David Trimble in May. But meanwhile, Mr Trimble's decision to pump millions of pounds into North Belfast has not been received with universal appreciation. No, I, I, mean, I just don't think that will work. It, it wasn't thought through, it was a reaction to the horrendous scenes that we all witnessed in the autumn. What I'm talking about is an overall strategy, a, a complete scheme for dealing with North Belfast because there hasn't been one. It's a criticism of the whole community that something like North Belfast has been allowed to develop. We have the, I mean, it really is a scar on the, on the whole of the North that people can point at all over the world. Where people looking at those nightly riots, the attacks on children going to school, all that kind of stuff, um, because there's just no overall strategy. For some of those on the interfaces, there's no end in sight to the effects of years of mistrust and bitterness. The turf wars seem set to go on as another marching season approaches. How far are you prepared to go in this? Where does this stop? Where, where do you draw the line here? When they stop. We're prepared to go the whole way until they stop. Far from when these get attacked, you have to go the whole way. All they have to do is one thing. Stop coming across the interfaces and attacking the wireless houses. They stop doing that. It's a matter of peace. That'll be it. That's a The Protestant communities in North Belfast are simply reflective of, of the broader Protestant base. Um, if, you, if you look, for example, the IRA was a rebel army uh, in Northern Ireland up until the peace agreement of Good Friday. Today, the UDA is the rebel army of Northern Ireland. The UDA represents a displaced Protestant working class. They don't feel they fit in anywhere and they are now rebels and they'll increasingly become rebels in the Northern Ireland state if we actually get to some, some particular agreement. So, so North Belfast is going to, the, the, the worst elements of the Protestant community are going to feed off that dissatisfaction in North, in North Belfast increasingly. While fear and mistrust drive young people to extremes and in interface areas, those who endure this frontline madness appear to be so desperate for a better way of life that they indicate a willingness to make gestures of peace. And I would be more than willing to talk to Catholics, the Catholic mothers, just like myself, just to get something sorted out here. Because there's going to be an awful, awful lot of lives lost. You know, I don't mean through trouble, I mean through depression. 
young men, young women even, will just have enough of it and God knows them anymore. It's going to end up like my son. I mean, I, I have no bitterness. I mean, I was asked before and um, when my sister got hit with that pipe bomb, what would you like to do to the person who threw this? I think he, he was expecting me to say, I want this to happen, I want that to happen. I, I won't want anything to happen. I want us to be able to live in peace. I know people who live there. I, I worked with them. You know, I have no bitterness towards anybody. I live here with my mum and my sister. I pose no threat to anybody. And I have my hand, and I'm saying now I have my hand out and my ears open to anyone who wants to speak to me or any, anyone here that can help sort out this situation. The chance that such neighbourly goodwill on an individual basis can prevail is extremely unlikely. The political instability here ensures that powder keg areas with deep-rooted social and economic problems and a sense of hopelessness are at the mercy of those with the ability to turn community strife on and off like a tap.